After returning from an international journey that lasted a week, I was caught off guard by an unexpected call from my mother-in-law, Judy. She was brimming with excitement as she shared news of a $52,000 windfall we had saved. Puzzled, I racked my brain trying to remember any occasion where such a large amount of money had come into play. As a freelance jewelry designer, I keep a savings account for emergencies, but I certainly don't stash large sums of cash. Moreover, my bank card, which no one else can access, was securely with me. Judy, sounding triumphant, explained that she found the money in the sideboard drawer and assumed it was all right to take it because we were doing well financially. Before I could probe further, she thanked me and hinted at relying on me for future financial help before hanging up. I was left in a state of bewilderment about the alleged missing $52,000. This confusion persisted until my husband, Edward, returned from work and clarified that there had been a significant misunderstanding. However, a month later, Judy bombarded me with calls. Initially, I ignored the incessant ringing, but the relentless notifications drove me to pick up the phone. Heavy with accusations for my supposed negligence, Judy's voice filled the room. She felt wronged, but in my view, she was merely facing the consequences of her assumptions. My life is shared with my husband, Edward. We are both busy individuals deeply involved in running my burgeoning jewelry design business. Early in our marriage, Edward's stable corporate job supported us, while my design gigs were sporadic. However, as my business took off around the time I turned 35, demanding more of my time and attention, Edward made a bold move. He left his promising career to join forces with me. Together, we landed contracts with top international brands, boosting both our careers and personal lives. Handling success brought its own set of challenges, particularly concerning Judy, who lived alone in the family home. She viewed our lives through a lens of affluence, often making financial demands. You always seem to be living so lavishly. I'm jealous, she would say. Although attending product launches and dinners with executives was part of my job, Judy saw these commitments as leisure activities. Her financial requests became increasingly personal, once asking for money to throw a party, despite the high costs and obligations associated with maintaining our business image. These episodes underscored the complexities of managing familial expectations alongside a thriving career. Living a seemingly glamorous life wasn't a choice but a necessity for our business. Judy, my mother-in-law, often viewed our lifestyle through a lens of envy and sarcasm, misunderstanding the real nature of our expenses. Dressed up beautifully, eating at expensive places, I envy you, she would say. Despite my efforts to explain, Edward, being her son, sometimes gave in to her financial requests, believing it a small price to pay for peace. If giving her a little money keeps her quiet, then it's worth it, he would rationalize, finding it easier to appease her than face disruptions. However, Judy's demands only grew over time. She recently expressed a desire for a new dress for an upcoming gathering. When she visited, she insisted on a specific expensive outfit, along with a matching bag, leaving us frustrated with her constant requests. To manage these, Edward had previously set up a credit card for Judy, instructing her to use it for personal expenses. Initially, she overspent significantly, and despite warnings from Edward, she continued her lavish spending. This pattern of financial demands was exhausting both Edward and me, as we tried to balance supporting family while maintaining the integrity and sustainability of our business. I found an exquisite ring and couldn't resist purchasing it, though I regret not informing you beforehand. Unfortunately, the bill was exorbitant, Judy admitted once, unaware of the financial strain her unrestrained spending was causing. Concerned, we considered it best to reclaim the card if spending remained unchecked. We simply cannot cover these costs, we explained. The credit card was in Judy's name, but Edward managed and paid the bills. Judy seemed to treat it as an unlimited resource, not fully understanding that every purchase needed eventual payment. As she didn't feel the direct impact of spending her own money, 
she used the card freely. To curb her spending, Edward decided to set a limit on the card. This decision led to Judy storming into our home, frustrated and complaining when she couldn't pay for her shopping. What the heck? I couldn't pay for my shopping the other day, she exclaimed. Edward, trying to maintain some level of peace, explained calmly, We had to lower your monthly limit because your excessive spending was straining our finances. But you two are still dressing up going to fancy places. How is what I'm doing any different? Judy protested, viewing our activities as purely recreational. That's part of our job, Judy. If that's a job, then what I'm doing isn't any different. Edward replied, hoping to bridge the gap between her perceptions and the reality of our professional demands. Judy argued that it was unfair she didn't get to partake in the glamorous events we attended. While it's true that our work involves attending product launches and parties at luxurious venues, these are strictly professional commitments, not leisurely pastimes. Despite her misunderstandings, setting a spending limit on Judy's credit card had brought a semblance of peace. Occasionally, Judy would share her grievances with Edward during her visits, but life mostly continued without significant interruptions. As the year drew to a close, an exhilarating opportunity emerged. A foreign brand manufacturer proposed that we expand our business dealings by relocating our base overseas. I was thrilled by the possibility of ascending to the ranks of top-tier designers, and Edward, ever supportive in his role as my manager, was fully on board. It's a chance we have to take, he encouraged. However, the prospect of moving abroad introduced a new concern, Judy. Given her past behavior, we worried she might insist on joining us. The idea of living internationally was appealing, but the thought of managing Judy's demands in a new country was daunting. When we shared our plans with Judy about moving overseas for work, she reacted as predicted. I want to come too, she declared, assuming our relocation would be an extended holiday. Edward attempted to set the record straight. We're going there for work. It won't be as leisurely as you think. Yet, Judy remained skeptical, accusing us. You're trying to trick me. You plan to live even more lavishly there without me watching. We're not moving there permanently. We'll come back after our work is done. I tried to reassure her, but she retorted, You're saying that, but you're planning to leave me behind, aren't you? Exhausted by the repetitive arguments, both Edward and I were weary. In an attempt to find a compromise, Edward suggested, Okay, we can't take you with us, but how about we pay for a week-long trip for you instead? Judy perked up at this. Really? Are you sure? We'll cover your flight and hotel, but you'll need to manage the rest, Edward affirmed. This momentarily appeased her, but peace was short-lived. A few days later, while Edward was busy with arrangements for our overseas move, Judy dropped by unexpectedly. Hey, Catherine, Edward said, but I want to shop over there too. Can you give me some money? She asked. What about the card that Edward gave you? I inquired, knowing she had a designated credit card for such expenses. Judy's face fell. That's the thing. Edward finally took it away from me the other day, she admitted. It appeared she had been reprimanded for overspending and, anticipating the financial challenges of managing different currency rates overseas, Edward had confiscated the card. Judy admitted, I don't have that kind of money on hand either. I can't give you money without Edward's approval. Can you ask him? Knowing Edward's clear stance on such matters, I suggested this, but Judy quickly dismissed the idea. It's no use asking him. That's why I'm asking you, she insisted, her voice tinged with frustration. Despite my reluctance, Judy somehow managed to embark on a 12-day international trip, which I assumed Edward had arranged the funding for. Upon her return, she phoned me, bubbling with excitement. I'm back, and it was so fun, she gushed, sharing stories of her sightseeing and dining adventures, details I hadn't sought and I overbought souvenirs. I couldn't fit them in my suitcase, so I had them shipped here. Can't wait for them to arrive, she exclaimed. That's nice, I replied, trying to maintain a neutral tone, though I felt a bit overwhelmed by her exuberance and the implicit costs. Thanks to the money you saved up, I had a blast, she added. Confused and alarmed, I responded, 
Saved up money, what are you talking about? I found it in your house's sideboard drawer, she explained, claiming she took $52,000. I was stunned. Why would such a large sum of money be stashed at home, especially not in a place as accessible as a drawer? Confused, I confronted her. I'm not sure what money you're talking about, but taking it from our house without permission is theft, even if you're family. Do you understand that? Judy's response was unsettlingly casual. That's why I'm telling you now. I used it. Consider it a post-factum report, she declared unapologetically. I was baffled. I have no idea about this money, but if you took it and used it without telling anyone, that's a crime. And if it was something Edward had set aside for an important transaction, it's even more serious, I explained, trying to make sense of the situation. Despite this, there hadn't been any noticeable disruptions in our business finances during her trip. You two live so extravagantly, so why can't I have a little of that? Think of it as doing a favor for your parent. It's not a big deal, right? She rationalized, showing a sense of entitlement that was hard to comprehend. It's one thing to ask for help from your son and his wife, but this is not how you should behave after taking someone else's money, I replied, still in disbelief. I'm glad you enjoyed your trip, but we need to address this issue seriously. When Judy casually mentioned using $52,000, she added confidently, I'll talk to Edward about it when he gets back. He'll understand since I'm his mother, and to him, $52,000 is just a drop in the bucket. Surprised by her nonchalant attitude and the misquoted amount, I promised to convey her perspective to Edward. That evening, a visibly distressed Edward arrived home. Catherine, did you see the money I left in the drawer? He asked with urgency. I took it out from the bank three weeks ago and now it's missing. Wasn't it risky to store such a large sum so insecurely? I needed the cash for a crucial payment, he continued, concerned. Do you know anything about it? It clicked for me then. Judy's phone call about having fun with $52,000 was referring to this money. Edward, Judy called earlier thanking us for $52,000, saying she thoroughly enjoyed using it. I was confused until now, I explained. Edward sighed, his expression turning serious as he shared more details. After I lowered the limit on Judy's credit card, she began secretly acquiring money through other credit sources. I discovered her debt and confiscated all her cards. I withdrew the cash to clear her debts without involving our business accounts or complicating our financial records. This was also meant as a parting gesture, as we were preparing to move abroad and wouldn't be around to manage her financial issues in person. A month has passed, and with the move coming up, I haven't been able to focus on Judy's calls, I admitted. When I finally answered, Judy's tone was desperate. Why aren't you answering? I've called so many times, she lamented on the verge of tears. I'm sorry, I've been busy with the move. What's happening? I asked gently. It's overwhelming. They demand payments daily. It's too much to handle, Judy confessed, clearly stressed. Have you tried reaching out to Edward first? I suggested, hoping she had attempted to resolve this with him. He's not taking my calls. Catherine, you're my last hope. Please, can you help? Judy pleaded. At that moment, I realized the gravity of Judy's situation. Her financial mismanagement had spiraled into a significant crisis. Now cut off from Edward's direct help, she was desperately looking to me for support. As we geared up for our new life abroad, resolving Judy's financial turmoil had become an urgent priority, demanding our immediate and careful attention. Before we could immerse ourselves fully in the exciting prospects of our new venture, I was shocked by Edward's unexpected handling of his dealings with his mother. If Edward had directly used the allocated funds to settle Judy's debts, the overwhelming barrage of collection letters and persistent calls from creditors could have been avoided. Instead, Judy found herself buried under financial demands, a scenario that seemed to be pulled straight from a dramatic movie, a situation I never imagined witnessing firsthand. At the end of our conversation, Judy, looking distressed, pleaded, please talk to Edward for me. Despite the pressing needs of our business expansion and the tightness of our financial resources, which made it impossible for us to extend any further help, 
especially since Judy had previously mismanaged the funds meant for her debts. I promised to speak with Edward. When Edward returned home, I shared Judy's situation with him. His response was a blend of exhaustion and resignation. I had plans to settle everything before we left, but she wasted the opportunity, he stated, his tone devoid of warmth. The funds meant to free Judy from debt had been squandered on a lavish vacation, leaving no room for excuses. As Judy's desperate calls continued, I reluctantly followed Edward's decision to block her number. Although part of me wanted to help, she was, after all, Edward's mother. His decision to distance himself from the situation left me with no choice. Amid the chaos of packing for our move abroad, I stumbled upon another distressing update. Judy was forced to sell her house to manage her debts, revealing even more undisclosed liabilities. The total amount was so substantial that even the sale of her property wouldn't cover it all. The loss of the family home, where Edward had grown up, deeply upset us both. Hey, our family home is gone. Are you okay with that? I asked, sensing his melancholy. How can I be okay? But there's nothing we can do, Edward replied his voice tinged with sorrow. The loss was reminiscent of how I felt when I lost my parents' home early in life. As we grappled with these intense emotions and the daunting task of packing, we realized that some situations were simply beyond our control. It was time to focus on our future and prepare for our new life in another country. The bittersweet reality of losing a family home struck a deep chord in me. Watching Edward navigate this loss was a profoundly affecting experience. It was not just about the physical loss of a building, but losing a piece of our shared history and emotional sanctuary, all while Judy, his mother, was still part of our lives. The blend of loss and displacement under such painful circumstances was indescribable, highlighting an impact far deeper than the loss of mere bricks and mortar. It was about losing part of one's very essence. Amidst the hustle of our new life, Judy, now living in a simple apartment, faced the everyday challenges of managing her overwhelming debts. At her age, working part-time posed significant obstacles. Job opportunities for the elderly were scarce, often physically demanding, and not very rewarding. This stark contrast to her previous lifestyle marked by unchecked spending and financial freedom, brought a complicated mix of emotions. Although it was tough to watch her struggle, it was a reminder that her predicament was largely due to her financial missteps. Life, as it often does, taught us through Judy's situation that actions have consequences and financial responsibility remains crucial at every stage of life. Meanwhile, back in our new setting, our business was flourishing unexpectedly well. The move overseas launched our brand into the international spotlight, attracting a stream of inquiries and offers from around the world. Each new email and call brought the potential for further expansion and collaboration, which was thrilling yet demanding. However, amid our professional success, our personal lives felt the pressure of relentless schedules. The dream of expanding our family seemed like a distant goal something we hoped to revisit once the waves of immediate demands subsided. Edward, handling multiple roles from logistics to client management, particularly felt this strain. As partners in both life and business, we often found ourselves reflecting on our future and priorities, trying to figure out how to align our professional ambitions with our desires. From the window of our apartment, Looking out at the cityscape with its neon lights blending into the night, I contemplated the stark contrast between this bustling, relentless city that was now our home and the quiet, stable life we had left behind. The complexity of our new life was exhilarating but daunting, filled with endless tasks and decisions that tested us at every step. Reflecting on Judy's situation and the broader implications of our family and financial decisions, I realized the importance of understanding how deeply our choices are intertwined with the fabric of our lives. Each decision, each sacrifice, and each success not only shaped our immediate circumstances, but also the legacy we were building. 
As we embarked on this new phase of our life, we remain mindful of the delicate balance between achieving professional success and maintaining the relationships that defined who we were beyond our business achievements. The journey was a continuous learning curve, underscoring the significance of every choice and its impact on our future. 